Today's episode of the Four Seasons of Film podcast is brought to you by Phil's Coffee. Phil's specializes in handcrafted coffee made one cup at a time. Visit a location today or find them on the web at philscoffee.com. That's Phil's with a Z, coffee.com. Find the beans you're looking for. Welcome to the Four Seasons of Film Podcast. Nathan Robert Blackburn here, episode 322. In the background, you can hear Nina, of course, chewing her bone. And with us, more important than Nina, is filmmaker Jager Moore, who rejoins us for his third? third? I don't even know. Yeah. Welcome back to the Four Seasons, man. Thank you. Yeah, Thank not you. the hotel. It's, it's much fourth, nicer. Actually. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think it is, too. Yeah. It seems like you've been here a lot, which is great. Yes. You should just join us every week. I'm down. Mm-hmm. I'm not watching the horror movies, though. Nah, that's all right. That's We saved that for our next person on the microphone. <laughs> See, he's getting good at this shit. Go, Jagger. Andy Pesha is here. You have to think about one shot. One shot It's what it's all about. A deer's got to be taken with one shot. I don't know what that's from. Deer Hunter. That's from Deer Hunter? Yeah. You picked, like, the most obvious line about deers? Yeah. What? Have, you, have you ever seen Deer Hunter, Jager? Yeah, I just watched it like okay. three oh, months yeah. ago. I figured that'd be a movie for you. I liked it a lot. Yeah. Well, the first time I saw it, I thought it was really long, but I was like 15. Yeah, I mean, I like for longer forms of entertainment. Yeah. Uh, now or always? I've always liked it. Yeah, I'd say always. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, uh, I had to earn my brain that I eventually wanted to possess inside my body. And now that I'm all of 34, I think I got it finally. So when I was 15, I was really ignorant to long forms, tepid dialogue, you know, slow movies. I think that longer movies earn the runtime most of the time. Yeah. I mean, there's some of them that are long as hell and don't deserve to be that long. But right. Examples? Uh, Titanic. I've Whoa, only seen the part holy where shit. Wow. I've only seen the part where it sinks. Wait, you haven't seen the whole movie then? Well, but I'm pretty sure you're, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> it just wasn't for you. That's what we're going to say on the podcast. Oh, yeah, we don't. But guarantee yeah. you, if you're trying to get a date later, say it's for you. Okay. <laughs> Isn't that right, Andy? That is totally correct. Yeah, Andy loves that movie. Yes, I do. I liked The Irishman. That was like, damn, yeah. what was that, three and a half hours long? I've seen oh, it four yeah. times now. Me too. You have? Yeah. I yeah. saw it in a theater, which I'm happy about. I'm really happy that you saw it in theaters, too. I'm really proud that Thanks. you saw it in theaters. <laughs> I really wish you we would have been able to take you to that screening, because that was a great, great night to see it on film. Oh, yeah, I bet. In, with Scorsese in the audience, that was fantastic. Mm -hmm. Speaking of SF Film events, we did get a chance. Again, SF Film, shout out to them. Thank you so much for hosting us. But we got a chance to go to a pre-screening of 1917, which we're featuring tonight on the Four Seasons of Film podcast. 1917 is a film about what, Andy? It no, is, no, 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 no. Don't cheat. Okay, I'll tell you my own. Um, yeah, I want to know what it's about from Andy's point of view. Yeah, it's about war, two soldiers uh, going through no man's land in World War One to deliver a message that to, uh, you know, call off an attack to save, I think it was like almost like 2000 lives. So it's the journey of those two young, brave soldiers crossing the lines. It's about much more than that. Oh, yeah. Um, it's, about brotherhood. it's about brotherhood. It's about the cause. It's about how ridiculous war is in a lot of ways. Um, oh, yeah. But Jager Moore. Why did you want to see this? And we should point out that you haven't seen this. So this will not be a spoiler heavy podcast because we wouldn't do that to a fellow filmmaker. Uh, well, first of all, there's not very many good World War One movies or very many in general. I mean, I guess yeah. there's a lot of good World War One movies, you know, like uh, what's it called? All Quiet on the Western Front. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. At Journey's End, mm -hmm. I think. Is, yeah. what, what, is that what it's called? At Journey's End? It's not, it was a on Journey's Amazon. End. Yeah. yeah. That was a really good one. Have you seen Paths of Glory? I haven't seen That's Paths a, of Glory. Great Kubrick film. Um, yeah. But I've been, I love, you know, World War One history and all that stuff. And it's rare that you get a good war film that really uh, tackles that subject. For whatever reason, World War Two is a lot more popular. I guess it's like a bigger war and you're, there's more stuff you can do with it. But World War One is... Uh, I think it's more interesting just because it's the ending of the old world and the beginning of the new world. And yeah. this one seemed like it was really taking the material seriously. And the whole, it, it wasn't just like, it didn't look like just a good new history movie like a lot of other ones. It was 
it actually seemed like it was doing something with the filmmaking with the whole long take thing. I don't know how mm. that actually translated because I haven't seen it yet, but it sounded really interesting. I really liked Birdman. I like long takes. I like all that stuff. So um, there's like a million reasons why I want to see this. I mean, I'm probably most excited for this since The Revenant. It's yeah. the last movie I've been this excited for. So Well, you're more like, I would, I, I don't want to put you into a box, but I think you're more lean towards films that uh, are about realism and about kind of the nitty gritty dirtiness of life and I want to say pain, but sort of the pain of the soul is how I've always considered your films in a beautiful way. Yeah, I'd say so. I like pretty depressing movies yeah, for sure. But that's a, that's a great thing. It's like I read this study the other day. It said, you know, listening to a sad song can actually make you happier and get you out of depression. Yeah, and I was like, I, I do that still to this day. If I'm feeling sad as you put on something sad and I'm like, man, I got it. I got that out of me. That's mm -hmm. good. Now let's go kiss some teddy bears. I think it's a pretty impressive thing to do to make somebody feel real sad emotion in a movie. And I think that's beautiful. And I think that the movies that are able to pull that off are some of the best. I mean, I can think of some pretty happy movies that I like a lot, but I think the sadder, yeah, the better yeah. sometimes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. It's why I watch a lot of Bergman films. I mean, a lot of people, if I put on something directed by Bergman, they would think they probably fall asleep or they would think that I was a psycho, but that's your normal film goer that um, I'm pointing at him um, that would, loves uh, the Avengers movies. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> I thought the infinity war was okay. I liked it. Is that the last one? No, that's, that's the end part game. one, right? Yeah. It's yeah. part one of the I thought last one's one end game. Did you watch end game? I did. I liked the infinity war better. Oh, interesting. Mm. I think they kind of threw out too much with the, the first one. I don't even want to get started. Yeah, on let's not. But anyway, that. Bergman films. Yeah, let's <laughs> yeah. go back to that. But they're they're very surrealistic and they're about, you know, uh, it always it always goes back to like cutting, you know, uh, cutting yourself or bloody vaginas or something like that. It sounds like Lars von Trier or something. It does. But it is. It, they're really fucked up imagery, surrealistic films. And I like that, that sometimes I watch these heavy heavy surreal movies and I have no idea what they're about even after I watch them five times and I used to feel bad about that when you watch a movie you read a book or you read a play or whatever and you go I have no fucking clue what this is about but actually that's that's kind of a great thing because maybe you got 10% of it maybe you got 80% of it maybe you got none of it but you still watched it five times to figure it out and maybe that's what the author was trying to do yeah exactly sometimes you you just it takes the fifth time and it's that aha moment, moment but you earn it. You mm -hmm. earn it. You know. I know how many books you've started you've never finished. Uh, yeah, okay. We don't have to bring that the up. Fountainhead? Well, yeah. That was a long book. Speaking of long, long-winded uh, <laughs> long and I just, pieces. Jager and I just agreed that long is better. Well, in, um, in film, <laughs> I, I, I am coming around on that. Yeah. But this movie, I will have to say, 1917, that is directed by Sam Mendes, now, what do we know about Sam Mendes? I'll tell you what I know is he directed American Beauty, yeah. which was the best picture winner of that year. I'm going to say 98. Yeah. 98, 99. No, 90, 98 was Titanic. I think 99 was American Beauty, uh, which was sort of this like dystopian family drama starring Kevin Spacey, who's kind of like Voldemort at the moment. You can't really mention his name right now. Rest in peace. But even though he's trying to make a comeback doing Shakespeare <laughs> in the streets of Paris for some reason. But I really enjoyed that movie when I first started, American Beauty. Now that I uh, have known Sam Mendes, this was a very strange movie for me to think about him directing. I, I, I sort of equate him with uh, uh, movies like Skyfall now, you know, or James Bond, bigger budget movies. So, But he also did Jarhead, right? Yeah. Did he do that? Yeah. yeah. He I really like that He talked one. about that. By the way, Sam Mendes was in, a, in attendance for a post-screening Q&A along with the amazing Roger Deakins. He was there, too. And talk about, I, I didn't know Deacons was going to be there until we were driving to the theater. So you can imagine I was pretty excited because he is just a master at what he does. It's almost redundant to say he's he's the best cinematographer working or one of the best of all time. It's like, yeah, no shit. There's no arguments here. Yeah. You know, he just is one of those guys. And after hearing him talk, he couldn't have been more aloof, laid back, easygoing. And I, I can imagine that's what it's like working on set with him. I He's know. been at it for a while. Yeah, it's, it's just kind of like the only thing that 
you know, you imagine it's it's a joke with him now. People go, and then what did he tell you about filming it in one take? Ha 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 ha. And, and at this point, he's like, can we talk about something else? Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't give a shit about the one take. It was a job. I did it. Did you like it? Good. Let's move on. Yeah. He's a no nonsense motherfucker. I love Roger Deakins, man. But 1917, like you said, Andy, it's a it's a it's kind of like a. You think it's going to be a buddy movie, which it's not a buddy movie. And we were talking earlier about the film um, before we started Jager. And it was kind of like it's about brotherhood and this and that. It's not even really about that for me either. No, it's it's so much more. In a weird way, it's a traditional screenplay that goes from beginning to middle to end. But there's something that is avant garde about it okay. where it's kind of esoteric to the point I would argue upon the second viewing that you could read into more scenes than just these two go to deliver a letter and what happens. Yes, of course. Yeah. It's, Wait, you saw it more than once? No, no, I oh. can just tell. I was like, I haven't even seen it once. <laughs> like, fuck you, man. Do your research. Get the tickets yeah. for the second screening. <laughs> but I will tell you this. After the screening, I I didn't walk away saying I'm blown away. It's, it's you know, top five of my mov movies of the year. I didn't say that, even though I was blown away and now it's one of my top top movies of the year. I was more thinking about how simple it was. And I kind of liked the fact that my my initial criticism of the film was there weren't moments that I went, holy shit, remember that moment? Remember this moment and this? And then I remembered, it's just two fucking guys delivering an, a letter in no man's land. Not a lot of shit in reality would happen besides they do confront the enemy. Yeah. You know, shit does go down occasionally. But it, not like it's the not like Steven Spielberg would direct this film where it's like, oh, my God, where's my mama? I got to cry out while I'm dying. You know, it's like that's the John Wayne version. And there's nothing wrong with those those movies. I like those too, like Saving Private Ryan. That's a great movie. Yeah. But in comparison, the realism of Saving Private Ryan also kind of there is a juxtaposition where it comes to reality because it's still a Hollywood glamorization of World War II in that way. In my opinion, I don't know if you, what, what you guys think about Private Ryan. I think it's a great film, but I always argue that it's I think it gets too much credit for being the best war movie of all time. I think it's really, really important for right. modern war movies, but the D-Day scene, I think, is what did it for everybody, and I yeah. agree with that. It's so real, and it really uh, enveloped you in the story at that point. But after the D-Day, I think it kind of went way more Hollywood with yeah. the story and everything. Absolutely. Yeah. It, that's when, they when realism Damon. was gone. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. God and I it. agree, it is, one of the, it is one of the best war movies of all time. But that's a, that's a big list. And there's so many that yeah. you could say are the best of because all time. it gives us the D Day scene and you know certain real elements of that war having not been portrayed on screen <laughs> for that time. Unless you're a big fan of foreign cinema, which foreign cinema really tended to pull less punches about war movies, especially World War II in general. I mean, Jagger, you and I talk about that movie, uh, was it Come and See? Favorite war movie of all time. All time. And that's my favorite war yeah. movie of all time because. That movie represents the most graphic account of World War II I've ever seen from all sides that it portrays. And I think it's set in Belarus. Is that right? I'm not sure. I can't remember where it's set. Andy, look that up. But it portrays both sides, you know, especially the Nazis, as exactly what I've always come to think, especially being a huge World War II buff. That's the version of the Nazis that I think actually actually existed and not this, you know, kind of Hogan's Heroes way in the, in the 60s and not in the John Wayne way, you know, in kind of like the, the, the late 40s <laughs> and early 50s movies. And then not even in the Spielberg way where it was kind of like they get really good lines to say before we do or don't kill them. Yeah. There's almost no talking in that movie. Yeah. It's literally what you see is a rugged movie that's about a journey that this little kid goes on because his whole family was just murdered by the Nazis. And then what does he do? Where do you go? That's the fucking movie. And as soon as I got out of 1917, that's exactly what I thought. It was that movie. And I was I didn't get to ask the question, but I, I don't like asking questions for Q&A. But that was the one I wanted to I wanted to know how big an influence Come and See was on 1917, because if it's not. Holy shit, right? Holy shit. Then they need to watch 1917 or they need to watch Come and See. And they're going to go, wow, we, I wish we would have seen this before we, we made this movie. It would have helped a little bit. And not that they need the help, though, because I thought it was a rugged, great movie. But Can you elaborate you, on what you thought was similar to? Um, all right. So 
come and see basically you feel like a camera is following this this boy through this kind of road trip on foot and you feel like the camera is just his buddy in the film you feel like you're right there with him you get dirty you get cold you get wet you get shot you see little children get, being murdered you see the nazis getting drunk and jerking off all together i mean it's like you see the things that you know how real life is always so fucked up like that? Yeah. You see the things you don't want to see. Yeah. That's what Come and See was. You see the side of the war that, even though it might not be in the history books, it sounds like the first-hand account of how people describe real war. Yeah, like the ones that might not talk about, but then when they finally open up and right. start describing... Oh, yeah. my I have a family member that was like that, yeah. describing, describing war. In my two grandfathers, I never got to meet them, but I, I like to learn as much about them as, as possible. One was a World War II fighter pilot. The other was on the infantry in Germany. So they had two totally different accounts of the war, but neither one would talk about it at all. Yeah. Only in, if they got too drunk on like a New Year's one time or two times their entire lives. And I've heard both those stories and they're really fucked up stories. And I'm thinking... That's the one with the truth serum. Think about the ones where they're bottled up. They're never going to talk about yeah. the ones that they're too afraid to tell. I want to, I, and I being a storyteller, I want to know what those stories are. How do I, how do I gain the trust of these people? Unfortunately for me and them, all, most of World War II veterans are all past. All of World War One veterans are past. So Jager, we're SOL there. Yeah. Um, well, but, thank God uh, they shall not pass came out. Yeah. Oh, or they my shall God. not grow old. That, I'm sorry. that was, yeah. and that was another one, and just a great eye opening. And having seen that, I'll tell you that made this movie even more fantastic because you kind of hold 1917 up to the standard of the knowledge that you know about World War One, and right. I know you know a lot, so I think you'll be most excited about that aspect of it. Is it the realism? I would imagine most directors would, good directors, would try to steer themselves towards more realism and the facts instead of, you know, somebody breaking down in tears, crying about, again, crying about their mama. And I know that happens. Yeah. But. Not like that. Right then at that time, of course it happened. Yeah. Yeah. There's no coincidence in war. This shit is mayhem. And in that great way, Sam direct Sam Mendez, I call him Sam, Sam Mendez directed Jarhead. And I wasn't the biggest fan of that movie, but looking back on it, what I love about Jarhead is because they were so fucking bored. Yeah. And from everybody that served post Gulf War, that's everybody I've talked to has told me that. It was so fucking boring. You don't even discharge your weapon. Not everybody. Yeah. Of course, we lost a lot of lives. America did, you know, and, and the world did in, yeah. in that in those wars. But at the same time, that's the difference between the war back then, the wars back then, the wars now. It's more technologically based and it's more boring. So when human life is lost, it is a bigger deal because it's even less necessary for human life to be lost. That's the whole drone yeah. argument is why don't we just send in the drones and you know they can bomb people we don't even see and we won't have to worry about it because our soldiers are back here controlling the drones. That's a whole different argument, but that's where I always see war going. It's like Terminator. We're yeah. not we're just, we're not going to we're going to sit back and press buttons. Yeah, right. Only Rock and soccer will die. Yeah. <laughs> and that then that's exactly that that's my biggest thing with with the drones. Then you can it's like a video game at that point. Yeah. 1917 wasn't a fucking video game, that's for sure. Let me tell you. I really enjoyed the movie. Oh, Let's yeah. get to the review. Okay. I enjoyed the movie because I'm not going to say it was like what I think Uncut Gems is going to be like. By all accounts, that's a movie that never quits. It's just fast paced until the end. This movie was a journey all in one take. And I'll get to I'll get to my opinion on the one take movies, especially this one. But there was a lot of moments of contemplation. There was beautiful cinematography from a technical standpoint. I would kill to be on the set the whole time just to see how oh, they pulled yeah. some of these shots off. I get every single time they cut. I'll just say it. Yeah, me too. I saw I it. I mean, if you know movies, you're going to see the cuts from a mile away. It's kind of like rope. There's probably only 10. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't read how many, but... There was, I, I, there was some I was like, man... 10, been, 16 at most. It's been going for a while. I didn't see the cut. I'm like, oh, yeah. it's running on 10 minutes right There's now. There's only a couple that are right out in your face where you're like, good job, Sam. But they <laughs> they don't try and make it obvious, right? They try and hide no. the cut through blurs and yeah, stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, like okay. it, it goes to darkness or it goes through a wall transition, right. okay. shit like that. You know, so to the untrained eye, 
Um, you can't shit but on we're it for look, that. I feel like we are looking for that. When yeah, we're watching right. It, you know, I like, wish nobody would have told me it was that. Yeah, and I would just been watching because then I'm like, oh, this is all in one take. How are they going to do this? Yeah, because yeah. when you watch like a scene that's a one take and you stop after the scene's gone. And you're like, holy crap, that was one take. Like but you didn't know that was going to be yeah, one yeah. take, so Absolutely. you didn't see any of the cuts. But I guess when it's one movie, you're going to try and look for all those little cuts. Right? Absolutely. What did you like about 1917, you dumb animal? I, I mean, I, coming out, I agree with you. I came out, it was like, man, this movie's great. I, I don't know if it'll be my favorite of the year. It, I don't know, maybe it might be in the top five, maybe not close to it. But the whole time, after, once they start going on the journey, like you... Like you said, nothing really goes on in the film besides when they, you know, they do encounter the enemy. But that's the tension of the film. When is that moment going to happen? And just knowing and seeing like just like the testament of will throughout this whole time after getting going through that and just putting yourself there like the movie did, like through the two hours that you're sitting there watching their lives. You're like really in it. And like I was scared for them. I, I felt with the characters that I thought the actor's performance was great. So it's just all around it was a great movie. It just I don't know. That's why I'm trying to figure out. Like, I loved everything about it. But why isn't it my favorite film of the year? You know? um, I think it was more anticlimactic than we thought it was going to be. Because you see that trailer with the airplane kind of exploding in the yeah. barn and everything. You go, wow, this is going to be like a Roland Emmerich film or something. And it's not. It's way more subtle than that. Oh, you know, wait. and I'm glad I'm happy to hear that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to hear that. It, the moments aren't huge Hollywood moments. The moments happen unexpectedly. They happen, you know, nothing, nothing happened. I was like, oh, they're at this part of the movie now. It was like, I don't know where the fuck they're going. But it doesn't feel like the world's standing still for that moment. No, right? okay. no. They keep moving because he has to keep moving. They're there. Maybe there's two, two moments in there where that, that have to happen because it's a, it's a war movie. And it's a movie. You have to have conflict. And conflict can only resolve in a certain few ways. That's just storytelling, you know. But at the same time, I still didn't predict that because I didn't care at that point. No. I wanted to just see where this ends, how this storyteller ends this story. And did I need more story? Absolutely. How, I wanted more story. How long is it? Just shy. Uh, two uh, hours. Yeah, okay. it's like 119, 118. Yeah, it doesn't break. It uh, it it literally moves at the perfect pace, though. Oh, yeah. You're just with it the whole time. Yeah. I wanted to see it immediately again after coming out of the theater. Who's the young actor that played the lead? Uh, he looks like a young Hannibal Lecter. So we, oh, that, that's uh, George McKay. <laughs> he was there on stage. Then, he, uh, he was, oh, he was fascinating to watch in this film. And then the other guy's uh, Dean Charles Chapman. Dean Charles Chapman. He was, uh, he was like his buddy in this film, and he was damn good too. Was there a moment in the film where it felt Hollywood at any time? Like there was a shootout mm. in between between those two, and they're taking on a whole battalion of enemies. Is no, it, no, there's never that no, moment. No, no, no. They was, always feel outnumbered. They always feel well. There's only two guys. Yeah, but, but it's a class. Classic case. But I feel like another movie would have had those two guys kill taking on the world. No, or not like that. absolutely not. A few, yeah. They had, yeah, they have single release cartridges that have six shots in in these rifles too. You know, right. So they, you have, to, and they're and they're all alone. So you, I love that they represent how minimal their their proportions were to bullets and yeah. and they couldn't even carry anything because the packs were so fucking heavy back then. They had to deliver one message, and the message is is so. It's about, that's the frustrating thing about this entire movie. It's, I kept thinking, what is he going to do? Walk up to this general and be like, here, the movie's going to end? Like, that's how insignificant these things are in history, but they're so significant now that it's all done. Yeah. That's so, um, I love, that's why I love movies. My favorite stories are the ones like, I had to take this message over the ridge. Took me seven days to do it. I, del I delivered the message. Story's over and it's like, Oh no, there's a movie in there because you did a bunch of shit in between this. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's what this movie felt like. It was like, and here this is what we we're gonna tell you before the mics were started rolling. Jager said it's not a true story. It is and it isn't. So Sam Mendez said that his grandfather would regale them with stories about World War II. And they say, Well, what was your favorite story? You mean World War One. Sorry, World War One. He said, what was your favorite story that he told? And he said it was a story about when he had to deliver a letter in no man's land to stop a, an, a, a, a German ambush. Mm -hmm. So what happened to them wasn't, that was, that was the, the screenplay, the Hollywood version. But the story's based on his grandfather having to do the same mission. So it's kind of like, yeah, it's not a true story, but it's the premise is. Something yeah. His yeah, grandfather which, told them. There's... Right. 
I, I, I don't have that luxury in my family. And my, I actually have a World War II script that I'm developing and it has nothing to do with only maybe one or two stories that I already mentioned. They're, they'll make it into the screenplay in some version, but I don't have the luxury of, uh, of the history of, in, even though my family served. Yeah. You know, I wish I did, but it's, those two stories are so very personal to me. I almost feel like I have to include them to honor my grandfather's of course. collective memories. Even if it's not the way it was, even if it's secondhand information, thirdhand, whatever, it's still, I really, really feel it's important to make the film because I want to honor their legacy for being in that war. Right. Well, you never, you ever told me, Andy, okay, so why, um, so now this movie definitely is one of my favorites of the year now. Yeah, so it was fun. And did, Jager, did you, do you know why? Have why, I, do why I, what? Have I explained enough where you know why it's one of my favorites of the year? Yeah. Okay. Do you know why Andy's on the fence? Um, well, I was going to first ask him what his favorite movie of the year was. And okay. Then why 1917, oh, the isn't it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, I can tell it's, that's it, his it, favorite it's movie. tough right now. I mean, yeah, I've watched the Irishman four times, but like once upon a time, Hollywood keeps creeping up there, you know? So it's kind of like, it's hard for well, me. We haven't right seen now. the lighthouse yet either. No, I haven't. You I haven't? Wanna, Interesting. I wanna, I wanna, and also need to see Ford v Ferrari. You know, I think okay. it might be a contender too for it, but yeah, yeah I don't know. I did just, um, but I did really you enjoy the You haven't seen Jojo film. Rabbit either. Yes. I want to see Jojo Rabbit's top five for me. Yeah, yeah I excellent. fucking excellent. love oh, that I movie, see man. That so bad. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. No, I enjoyed the movie. It was for me. I enjoyed it immensely, man. So, but I don't. You know, that's what I'm still trying to figure it's it out. It's a podcast, Jesus. Figure it out. Besides the things that are obvious, why did you like it? Oh, because I. I mean, I want to get, kind of get into this too about the 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 um you know the one shot. Go unquote. ahead, man. We got we got uh, limited time now because you yeah. just blabbled on for like. 45 fucking minutes. It was like seconds, but the, uh, oh, no, that was me. <laughs> yeah. But like, I, 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 I really did like, even though I, I wish I didn't know it was like going to be like one long take, like you said, like, I think you, you know, would have figured it out in the first five minutes. Oh, of course. Yes, I would have, <laughs> but no, I really enjoyed it the way they did it. It was awesome. I thought it was great. I, I mean, people blowing smoke up people's asses about it. I think it's somewhat deserved. You Do know? you think that the movie wouldn't be as good if it wasn't a long take? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I do too, for sure. You yeah. think it wouldn't be as good? I'm yeah. not a big fan of the one takes. I don't like the gimmick nature of it uh, because I've seen it done in a way where I can't watch the movie without thinking that's that one take movie. Got to prepare my mind for that. You know, I want to forget about the one take. I forgot about the one take in this. Oh, yeah. Only when it was it came time where it was like, oh, shit, they haven't cut in a while. Where are they going to cut? Oh, there it is. Yeah. You know, so you, you forget about it, you know, and Birdman, the whole time I kept thinking about the one take because it was just so obvious in your face because mm -hmm. it was such close quarters. But no, one take movies. Yeah, this movie made me forget that it was one take, even though going into it, I knew I was going to be searching for it the whole time. Thankfully, no, I didn't care about the one take. No, but, and but I think it would you, take away. But so it, you would think it would take away. And, yeah. OK. If you went in for coverage and any of these scenes. It would take away from the entire movie because it was, we have to move forward. Yep. Okay. And if we don't move forward, if we stop and cut, then the movie stops and you become stagnant. It becomes every other World War II film, World War I film, any war film. It, it had to deliver on its message and not even in that video game way, because I kept thinking it might be like a video game, like a first person shooter kind of right. thing. Call of Duty. Didn't they do one of those movies? It was all in first person shooter. Oh uh, yeah, that was like the hardcore Henry. The hardcore Henry, yeah. But that was like a. It was not realistic at all. It, it was, was like a heist a, movie. I wanted. I didn't see. I it. liked it. It was. Oh, it, was okay. a, it was a guilty pleasure movie for sure. But oh, okay. It was really fun. See, that's fun too. There's no such thing as guilty pleasures, man. If you liked it, that's pleasure. Yeah. You don't have to apologize to anybody. You're a filmmaker. Be like, fuck you. I like it. It was really well done the way they shot a lot of that. Right, movie. I'll watch it now because I was curious, man. I want to see movies like that. You know, when it's when it's gimmicky, I'll watch it for sure. But I don't like. The word gimmicky. Yeah. Well, I don't like that. It I have was. To, yeah, exactly. It, knew what it, was. it wasn't trying to be something when it wasn't. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, that's all I got to say about that. Yeah. Watch it, man. I'm right. excited to hear about Richard it. Jewell. Ooh. But we're going to take a quick break and come right back and talk about Richard Jewell. Coffee is coffee everywhere in the world until you find the beans you're looking for. Handcrafted with passion, history, and research, Phil's coffee is brewed one cup at a time for a cup that feels like it was made specifically for you every time. With over 16 locations in the San Francisco Bay Area, Phil's Coffee has been hailed by SF Weekly as the best coffee in San Francisco. Time Magazine called their French press coffee the best you'll ever have. Phil's is the perfect way to start your day. Phil's even has a coffee of the month. 
From now till the end of the year, Phil's is featuring their Tessera Holiday Special. Seven years in the making and the first blend to ever be created, the Tessera is a treasure that consists of the most valuable and complex jewels of coffee. Tessera, a grand representation of coffee and the way coffee should taste. All pound bags of Tessera will be $10. That's a 38% savings. It doesn't get any better than that. Don't live in the Bay Area? Still want Phil's Coffee? No problem. You can get Phil's Amazing Roasts online at philscoffee.com. That's Phil's with a Z, coffee.com. Start your day the Phil's Coffee way. Welcome back to Four Scenes of Film Podcast. Filmmaker Jager Moore is here. Sup? And Andy Pesha. So this week we're talking about Richard Jewell. <laughs> That's What's funny. Richard Jewell's middle name? Let's find out about this movie from Jager Moore first. What do you know about this movie, Jager? Isn't it directed by Clint Eastwood? My man. Um, Still going. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, that's the biggest thing about Clint Eastwood is he's like 90 fucking years old, Holmes. And he's making okay movies. Yeah. Did you yeah. see The Mule? I, I actually really like that, that movie. One. Was sweet. Yeah. Jersey Boys. Sully, Sully was my first IMAX experience in my I've ever done, and I think it was the only one I've ever done so far. IMAX, yeah, like was, traditional it, IMAX, not even with the veranda. It's it, the one in San Francisco. Oh yeah, the, yeah. at the what's it called, the Met- Metreon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah. I, it was kind of an underwhelming movie to see on the IMAX. I'll but, bet. Uh, <laughs> I really like the Mule, but I really don't know anything about Richard Jewell. It looked interesting from. Uh, from the trailers. But do you know about the controversy and like the bombing and Richard Jewell in general? No, I do not. Because you know a lot about fucking everything. I don't know anything about You don't about need this. that in your brain. <laughs> but we, I'm surprised I do know as much as I do know about it. It's probably because I lived through it. Yeah. Uh, 1996 uh, Atlanta Olympics. This was a big controversy. It I mean, was. You can tell me, you, here's what I remember about being a kid. First of all, this movie is about this guy, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> it is about Richard Jewell. You know, sometimes they're like, it's uh, Richard Jewell, but it's actually about the detective that's investigating Richard Jewell. No, it's about Richard Jewell, who was the security guard that found the bomb at the Olympics. And the actor that played Richard Jewell was in Black Klansman. Yep. He that's was, the same I, guy. He I was like, know. yeah. And he was fantastic in that because he was fucking hilarious. Yeah. And he was a Klansman. So that's that's why he was so good. It was like, you made a Klansman funny. But that's why Spike Lee's so good too, because he made a lot of Klansmen funny in that movie. Yeah, and he was, and he wrote the script. And he was also in um, I Tanya. Yeah, he played a guy that looks like Richard Jewell in I Tanya. Yeah, it, there, uh, but he looked just like that guy in, that did that whole like uh, smacker on the, the knee the, thing. Yeah, he was the one. Why? That <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that was creepy. He's, so yeah, he he's a good actor. I wanted to see this. So Richard Jewell was the security guard that. Famously was accused of causing or planting the bomb in the 1996 Atlanta Olympics. Yeah, but he, but people suspected him of being a false hero because he was the one that found the bomb as well. So because he found the bomb, they thought he planted the bomb. Yeah. My question was like, why would you, if you've planted the bomb, that's actually a pretty good cover. Hey, look at this! I mean, a lot yeah. of people who murder their significant others will call in the crime right. saying that somebody else did it to it's, make them not look It's guilty. a whole specific uh, profile of criminal, too, yeah. that, that you learn in this film that they're molding him after. Okay, so that's what I know about it. What's the movie about, Andy? So it's about uh, Richard Jewell. He is the only... Sus- <laughs> Just say exactly what I said. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but no, it, it follows the events. You see some of uh, when he's like a, a younger man, like older as an adult, and that's uh, how he meets um, Sam Rockwell, who eventually becomes his attorney. Um, they work together at this other firm, and you see... A little- oh, becomes his attorney? Yeah. And he- how can he afford him? Get we'll, it, we'll get, get, get into I'm that. I'm sold at Sam Rock. Me too. And uh, I love me some Sam Rockwell. And so it shows him, you know, Jojo Rabbit through through some of his Jesse other James. other Ooh. jobs um, until he gets to way way back. Seven Psychopaths. You win. <laughs> Moon. Yeah, Moon was good. He was alright. Fuck off. Three billboards <laughs> in Missouri. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, so and then Confessions of a Dangerous Mind. <laughs> and then he eventually becomes a security guard. And then you see the events. This is events. what we do. He's talking faster now. He's like, Jesus Christ. And the investigation that goes into him. And, you know. Uh, Who? I, Who? The investigation that goes into Richard Jewell. And the oh, FBI we're talking about Richard Jewell now. Questioning okay. him. And, you know. And, uh, I mean, I'm not spoiling anything, I don't think, because it's a historical movie, right? It's all fact. But you know how people are with facts. Yeah, exactly. So it, I thought it was, I thought it was, it was all right. It was well, all right. Clint Eastwood's like Jager said, he's making, he's still making movies. Yes, one a year okay? almost, and he's making, 
entertaining movies. Yeah, mostly. Yeah. Yeah. The and- Mule shocked me because I was like, what the hell is this movie? Wow. <laughs> this is fucked up. I think I liked that one a lot more than I... If Clint Eastwood wasn't in that one, I don't know if I would have liked no, it as much. Because he is like a nine-year-old white yeah. guy and you're like... I just love Clint Eastwood as an actor. Yeah, he's so fantastic. Yeah. Favorite Clint Eastwood movies? Uh, Dirty yep. Harry. Wow. Uh, Outlaw Josie Wales for the me. The Good, Bad, and the Ugly. Yep. Uh, Unforgiven is probably my favorite. Well, I love Unforgiven. That one's so simple. It's great. Yeah. Oh, everybody in that's so good. Gene Hackman's fantastic in that movie. Don't look up Clint Eastwood movies. No, I'm not. Yeah, I just saw what you're doing it over there. It was on his director tab, so I couldn't oh see. Oh, my God. What are you going to say? Like blood work? Oh, yeah. I love that. You Gran mean, Torino is good. I, I like seen that one. That's what Gran Turismo. Is Gran Torino. Gran, yeah. Torino. Gran Turismo is a video. It's the one that yeah. says famously, get off my lawn. Yeah. 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 He was one of the few good actors in that movie. Yeah. Oh, I have seen it. You're yeah. right. Because like the gang members are all pretty bad. In Everybody that movie. besides Clint Eastwood. Yeah. Is, but like, even, the, still, even he like holds the good the, people. He holds the whole movie up. It's still really good, even with he, bad actors, because yeah. he's a good director. It seems like he is that guy. Yes. That's probably like, get off my lawn. <laughs> yeah, right. um, one of his underrated movies that not a lot of people talk about, uh, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. I really like that movie. Oh, yeah. He yeah. did do that. That's a good I one. love that movie. Yeah. Uh-huh. You ever see that one? I no. never even John Cusack. Ooh, but you know, his his directorial debut is one of the best psychological thrillers especially about relationships i've ever seen in my life it's called play misty for me holy shit it's set in monterey and i know you guys have been to monterey probably right yeah and it's set in the hills of monterey and it's about the he's a radio clint eastwood is a he directs it and he stars in it He's a radio show personality, like a jazz a jazz show personality. Mm-hmm. And the uh, Monterey Jazz Fest is coming up. And this woman, this call-in woman, asked to see him. She's a big fan of the show. And it's like Fatal Attraction. He sleeps uh, with their very first, like, very first scene. And move. then she will not leave. Yeah. And wonder- he has, like, a real girlfriend, of course. And then she starts getting cray-cray. I and want it's to see it. amazing. Cray cray. Yeah. Oh I pull that God. out because when you watch, you're going to be like, cray cray. <laughs> <laughs> Fatal Attraction. That's a good movie. Yeah. This was way better. A way better movie. Oh my I have God. To check it out. It always, yeah. When you watch movies about this, you go, I don't think I want to be in a relationship with anybody in <laughs> life anymore. I don't want to shake hands with anybody anymore. You can see Because you see this kind of shit in the headlines too that happens and you go, wow. Yeah. So with Richard Jewell, is it kind of one of those Clint Eastwood movies where he's just kind of stating the fact stories, the, yeah. uh, the story by the numbers? Because I feel Sully. like that's when supposedly, yeah, his, yeah. Some of his biographical films are are kind of like that. Yeah. It just goes by the numbers of what happened. Yeah. Like here's the thing: the biggest thing about watching it, like I'm glad I saw it. I'm glad I watched it once. I'm good. Yeah. You know, like it's one of those movies like, will it? Will I watch it again? Maybe if it's on TV, HBO or streaming or something, maybe I might watch it again. Well, is it a trial movie? Is it a detective movie? It, Do you think he did it? Do you not think he, do, he did it the whole time? I think this guy does just points to him as being <laughs> the, the bomber. Everything he does, like these, he's just such this quirky guy that when you put all the evidence together, you could see why. By that, you could have been the bomber. So, yeah, they talk about that in the movie. It could be you. you they they mentioned me. you? Yeah, me specifically. So Richard Jewell doesn't do it. He gets away, and then obviously there's a title screen that says what happens to him. Yeah, yeah. And from what I wanted to see the movie I, was, there's a reporter in this mm-hmm. played by... Olivia Wilde. Olivia Wilde, and she's been she's she's getting controversy lately in the news because she's saying she was misrepresented. Yeah, the, the reporter, Kathy Strauss. Because she's like really hardcore against the fact well, like she's like Richard Jewell did it. Well, that too. But she what the controversy is, is in the film, John Hamm plays the FBI director that's in charge of the investigation. And the scene supposes that she says, hey, if you tell me who you're investigating, I'll have sex with you. And, they, you know, they. It, Whoa. And so that's why. To Richard they, Jewell? No, 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 no. Oh, to John Hamm. John Hamm. Okay, well, so that makes way more sense. Because she wants to get the inside tip, like, who's your suspect, right? Well, of course they cast John Hamm because what woman wouldn't be like, well, I was going to do that anyway. But the controversy is it's like saying that, you know, the. <laughs> it was. It, first off, the uh, Atlanta Journal is saying it wasn't like that at all. And they, uh, you know, just the sexism of uh the woman has to sleep her way to the top but and that's the same thing well john ham she you know and that's the thing that people are on both sides of the fence so it's this whole big thing and the movie actually kind of took a hit for it because it was considered a flop it only more made- like john prime rib 
<laughs> and so the, uh, the movie is considered a flop. It only made five million dollars this weekend. And Richard of, Jewell, all his movies are flops. They're not for they're not for general mass consumption. They are for people that watch these movies at home. It's it's going to be a huge streaming thing, HBO thing. You know what I mean? It's for people that would be like age. Clint Eastwood movies now. I'm not trying to you know promote ageism. I love uh, Clint Eastwood movies, but he's reached an age where it's kind of like he's tapped into this Americana in the retirement community. Yeah, because all of grandparents, you know, parents that are of a certain age, shit like that, they love Clint Eastwood movies, like these Clint Eastwood movies specifically, because they. They're easy, they're safe movies, and, and then people have lived through them. And yeah. they lived through the 90s when this happened, and they they want to feel some kind of reverence for that. You know, what, whatever happened with all that? I don't know about that. I wouldn't be shocked if he did that Oklahoma City bombing. It was his next movie or right. something, you know? Because he covers topics that happen pre-9-11 that haven't been covered, really, on this biggest scale. Yeah. But I always, my favorite Clint Eastwood movies are the ones he can't make anymore, where he stars as, like, the Mule was, that's why I kind of like, because it, it was like him back in his prime playing a badass again. Yeah. But his then, Westerns are the best. Yeah. And he, but he still was like, well, I'm, I, but I'm a grandpa. We got to be realistic here. I'm only going to have two threesomes. He needs to make, <laughs> hell yeah. he needs to make one more Western. One more Western. One more. Yeah. That sounds like a job for filmmaker Jagger Moore. Richard Jewell bored you, and are we done? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the acting was great. Sam Rockwell and Paul Walter Hauser, um, you know, playing Richard Jewell and Watson Bryant or. Uh, playing his lawyer is a different name than the lawyer. They changed some of the, they added like the FBI agent, like John Hamm plays is like a culmination of like four. So it's pretty much like every other. Yeah. Paint by the numbers. Real biopic Clint Eastwood's doing. Did you see the one about the real soldiers that, you know, stop the terrorist attack? Like it's, it's like the 1215 to Paris. Oh yeah. I saw something. that one. Yeah. Yeah. The, on the train. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I wasn't that. a big fan of that one. I thought it was all right. Yeah. I thought I it was. I just didn't like the, the use. I, I love that the fact that, you know, these real guys did that. I don't know. It's sort of gimmicky that he got the real guys to do it. Didn't Act of Valor did that too? Did they really? Act of Valor was, I think it was yeah. way before. Yeah. But that's another one. Was that good? Navy SEALs. Uh, I don't remember it. So probably uh, not. That wasn't the one about Marcus Luttrell, was it? I do not remember anything okay. about this movie. Yeah. But I don't know. Casting real people to play themselves, it's always hit and miss. Uh, and when you cast all of them to do it and carry a movie, that's what I was worried about. And it was like, the whole movie, you kind of are just apologizing for how good a director he is mixed with how untrained these actors are, even though they went through this horrific thing. It's it's unfair to do the audience because you can't say it's bad. Yeah, yeah. right. You know, it's like, they all right, this. And, and nobody went to see it. Yeah. You know? I, I thought it was all right. Yeah. I, I, I didn't 12, 15 to Paris, I, I think it's called, uh, right? Uh, 15, 17 to 15, Paris. 15, 17 to Paris. My, my title's better. Yeah, right. <laughs> Different train. <laughs> my digits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good directing. Are you going to remember this movie? I mean... I remember I'm going to see it, but like specific things. I mean, I would just think of the ridiculousness of how he is this character and all these things that he does makes him more of the suspect. Right. And just think like they're like this guy's weird as shit. And you just think of that weird guy. Mm. But he had it. But all intentions, he kind of had a good heart. You know, don't or they portray in this movie? Don't be shocked, Jagger, though, is because uh, you were you were with us last year when we heard Andy's favorite movies of the year. And this will be one of his like top one or two based on this podcast alone. Don't judge him for what he says now because he just disappoints every single end of the year. It's so fucking frustrating. His picks this year sound okay. Yeah, but that's, that's not when he does his list. Cause then it's like, let's just turn the whole fucking world upside down. <laughs> let's just say black is white and red is green. I think the top three this year, you're going to know, but you know, four through 10, you don't. Next week is the last episode of the, the decade. year and of the decade. The last four seasons of film podcast of the decade. So I figured that'd be a good time for us to roll out our top movie list of the year. I'm thinking top five is appropriate. Jagger, I don't know if, if you want to be here or not, but at least give us your top five list and we'll, we'll at least read yeah, it, I'll do, I'll read it on the air. I'll come. We're doing Star Wars. Rise of Skywalker. <laughs> here's like, I'm not, here's, I'm not here's coming anymore. Here's the thing. Yeah. I will not pay to see that movie. <laughs> but I'll watch it. I'll watch it, but I'm not paying. Okay, Andy will pay for you then. No, he already got tickets. And no, 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 no. Is it sold out? No. Yeah. I, no Maybe not. I can't. Maybe not. So thank you very much. Uh, definitely go see 
1917 in theaters on Christmas Day. It's getting released then. And uh, check out Richard Jewell uh, on, a- on A&E. If you live in Florida, I <laughs> yeah. guess. Yeah, you really like that. I, yeah, <laughs> it's probably going to win an image award by the uh, AARP or something like that. Yes. Um, but I'll see it when it comes out, you know, yeah, to be available watch. somewhere. Um, I'll, I'll probably watch it. Yeah, man. Clint Eastwood, still directing, still putting his ass out there. He's not in this one, Love though. Him. No, no. But yeah. you'll, you'll learn some things, right? You come back. Oh, apparently uh, I will. Less than I thought, though. Okay. I'm not spoiling anymore. <laughs> yeah. For what, in 2020? <laughs> it's going to be a spoiler-free <laughs> decade for Mandy Pesha. That's right. Uh, well, thank you very much again for being here, Jagger Moore. We always, uh, we always love having you on the podcast. Thanks for having man. me. I like coming on. Yeah, Hopefully it's fun. people like listening to me. <laughs> and thank you, Andy Pesha. One decade of podcasting down, even though we've only done it six years. Yeah. Well, six years is still more than half the decade. Fuck yeah. We, so, yeah. I guess we'll get sentimental next week. What are we doing? I don't need <laughs> one decade down. We have one more episode left. Yeah, that's right. For myself, Nathan Robert Blackburn, check us out at fourscenesoffilm.com for all your podcast needs. And we'll see you next week for Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker, the last episode of 2019. Keep film alive. Keep film alive.